Welcome to All Things Apostolic. Today I'm going to be speaking with Pastor Miles Young about demonic possession, varying levels of demonic activity, and we're going to give some practical guidance. You're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to All Things Apostolic. My name is Dr. Casey Cease. Today I am joined with my pastor, Pastor Miles Young, pastor of the Rock Church of Elk Grove. And today we're going to continue our discussion on demons and the demonic. And so one of the first questions I want to ask is based on a question that was posed in the video um, with you and Dr. Wilson. And Brother Rayner asked, can you elaborate or talk about um, whether or not a Christian can be possessed. And his question came from the standpoint of he's seen a lot of this arise in more of what we'd call the charismatic movement and kind of creeping into the apostolic movement. And so he wanted a little clarification on, on that. Well, I don't believe, number one, uh, we base our doctrine off of the Word of God. And nowhere in Scripture do we see evidence of someone who is spirit-filled Holy Ghost spirit field yes, sir. that is also uh, possessed of an evil spirit. And there's a pretty good uh, baseline is that what fellowship hath light with darkness? Mm. And how can two walk together except they agree? So, number one, you have a hard time. Uh, number one, the heart's not big enough for both of those things uh, to, be, <laughs> to be in that heart. Uh, and we also know that that the the clean is made unclean uh, in the Old Testament, and so uh, the impossibility is very very clear to me that a believer who is truly filled with the Holy Spirit, biblically, in a biblical way of new birth, I'm not talking about a believer saying I believe and accepted Christ. Uh, we're talking about two different things, but a, a truly spirit-filled person uh, cannot, in my opinion, based off of what I see in Scripture, I think it's very plain. It is, it, it's an impossibility. Okay. And so what you're saying then is someone that has been, someone's repentant, someone that has been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the Spirit and being led of the Spirit cannot be possessed by a demon. Yeah, and that's not to say that they cannot return. Yeah. To, I mean, because we do not believe in once saved, always saved. So, you know, the Bible teaches he that endureth to the end. That means you got to stick with this Absolutely. thing, right? Salvation is not just a one-time experience. Salvation is ongoing work of grace and a, an enduring to the end. And we also know that there can be a deliverance. And we also know that if that person walks away from that deliverance and goes back like a dog to its vomit, the Bible says that uh, that those spirits can come back seven times more than at the beginning. So I have I have seen people who were at one time spirit filled and were true believers, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, that walked away from truth and became, uh, I mean spiritual vagabonds wandering around in into the craziest mess and addictions and I have seen them possessed of devils but there is no way for the indwelling presence of God uh, God's not going to live in a dirty house it doesn't work that way Amen. and sometimes when we talk about this at least in my experience I think a lot of times we try to put all of the emphasis on demonic spirits but biblically I, I think it would be appropriate to argue that there are three maybe major influences that could lead someone down this road. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it talks about the world being an influence, love not the mm -hmm. world. Um, also in Romans 7 and Galatians 5, it talks about the flesh of humanity. Mm -hmm. And then obviously in James 4 and 1 Peter 5, here's where it talks about demonic activity. And so I think um, we need to be careful uh, this is where I think you and I were talking previously about discernment yeah. um, because it could be the world um, that has drawn people away, not necessarily demonic. It could be something in our carnal nature, our flesh, and it could be the devil. I remember here, and I think it was in a conversation with, with a gentleman I consider an elder, um, talking about um, 
casting out the ability to cast out devils, but we don't have the ability to cast out flesh. Correct. Correct. And he said something to the effect of, well, I don't, I don't have a problem with the demonic because I can cast that out, but I've got to negotiate with the flesh. And so I think when we talk about dealing with this, we have to be able to discern, is, is this just the person? Um, is there an abnormality with this person? Or is it truly demonic activity? Um, I also think when we look at um, demonic activity in the life of an individual, whether it be a believer or humanity in general, um, that we understand there's different realms or different levels of demonic activity. And so, for instance, Matthew 12 and 22 uh, talks about one that is possessed with a devil, whereas Acts 10, 38 talks about individuals that were healed, that were oppressed uh, of the devil. And then again, we see in Acts 5 and 16, where it talks about individuals being vexed with an unclean spirit. And I think I've heard a couple times where people use this, but put it maybe in a different nomenclature that's easier to remember, and that is uh, possessed, oppressed, and obsessed um, in terms of that. So what are your thoughts on uh, possessed, obsessed, or oppressed? I haven't heard that uh, expressed quite that way. That's very interesting. It's very thought-provoking. And uh, let me start with the latter the obsessed. I think that obsession can lead to possession. Yeah. I have seen people get obsessed with things. You know, it's almost like the thing you feared has greatly come yes. upon you. Uh, and, and maybe this is what's happening. We've been talking about Gen Z last week, Brother Boston, youth pastor here, and then a little bit on the Monday broadcast. Uh, maybe this is what Hollywood and the movie industry uh, this love affair with witches and, and mm -hmm. witchery, uh, an obsession, Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, uh, the, the gaming industry. All of these things are creating, uh, trying to make it normative, then get people involved in it, then, then they become obsessed with this. And I would say that there's going to be spiritual help in that obsession that those spirits are going to come along to, to nudge and push. Absolutely. You know, if you can be oppressed with the devil, then, and the fiery darts of the enemy come to our mind, it's yeah. going to be nudging you that yeah, way absolutely. and bringing, and, and then an unhealthy obsession. It's like, I just want to read another book, want to, want to play another Ouija board, want to go to another palm reading. I mean, these are things that you and I as believers wouldn't think about, but if you're on a, if you're on a journey where life is dysfunctional for many of these latchkey kids and young people that are dissatisfied with life and just want to explore and they're touching into the spirit world. And, you know, one of the things that I was talking to Brother Mutu from uh, Asia, he was in the United States preaching, and we were talking about the, the new love affair with yoga, mm -hmm. not just yoga pants on women, you know, but, but the love affair that America has with yoga that, that he said, the reality is I'm from the world. He said, where that came from, you know, and, and yoga, we're thinking it's this physical activity of just stretching and trying to get in shape. He said, but the young, there is very real spiritual connections with the body. And even, I mean, we're seeing the display of flesh and the, in the, the attire of that's become normative on our streets. And it's embarrassing but but now this acceptance of this Eastern mysticism that involves the, the actions of the body. And he said, people have no idea what they're tapping into. Doorway. Yeah, it's, it, it actually is. One of the things that I found interesting about obsessed, or as the Bible says in Acts uh, chapter 5 about vexed, is uh, in Strong's Concordance, it labels it as to disturb, to trouble, molest it or mm -hmm. to be in confusion. And so when they're highlighting this vexed and, and in light of some of the things that you just said, um, if you think about it from an obsession standpoint, it's to be in confusion. Mm -hmm. And so these, these things that we don't understand the spiritual significance of has the opportunity to create confusion then in the life of the believer. And Which fits with what was the Bible talk about silly women that are taken captive and, and you know that are that 
It doesn't mean they're silly as in our term of silly. It means it means feeling a lack of. Mm-hmm. There's there's a need, a, a feeling of uh, inadequacy, and so they're longing for something. It's the old battle of image with with uh, Lucifer in the garden with Eve, and, and people when they begin to feel inadequate, they're looking for something, and and it it becomes a doorway where they're nudged and pushed, and the oppression can lead to. A variety of things. Absolutely. Yeah, so when I, when I was looking at these passages of Scripture and looked at the difference between vexed and just to be oppressed, when we look at strong, strong says it is to exercise a harsh control, and it has the connotation of dominating one's thoughts and minds, mm-hmm. but not controlling to the sense of possession. And so we see vexation, it is to disturb, it's to trouble, it's to cause confusion. Um, the next level in oppression then, uh, according to Strong's and looking at it, is to have one's thoughts dominate it um, and their minds dominate it. So it almost, you see this, first you have a little bit of a vexation or an obsession with something, and then you move from there to kind of where you had said about the difference between this slight, gentle nudge to, to mm-hmm. now you're feeling yeah. a little bit more weight on you. and. After a while, you keep going down that road. Well, that's then where it could lead to possession, which um, Strong's is to be under the power or authority of. Um, It is when a demonic spirit has taken full control of somebody, and it implies with it complete or control, uh, absolute control by the demon of the individual. Now, I don't want to necessarily exaggerate the devil or demon's power uh, because we do see an example in uh, the Gospels in which the demoniac, not having been filled with the Spirit, but still had the ability in himself to take that step towards Christ. And so while there is this possession in terms of it grabbing a hold of someone, there is still also that ability for the individual to make the conscientious decision to move away from that. And so when we look at someone that is demon-possessed, um, what do you look at in practical approaches? Like if, if someone came into the service um, this coming Sunday and they were possessed of a demon, uh, what are some practical approaches that you might take? Okay. Uh, as a pastor, I've had that happen. Uh, as an evangelist, I've seen numbers of demon-possessed people delivered. Uh, I have been where there was no deliverance, uh, and it was not a lack of power uh, because the Holy Ghost is powerful, but there was no desire for deliverance. And uh, where there's no desire, uh, I was sitting in Brazil a few years ago, and uh, a man came up speaking perfect English, uh, totally sane, totally normal, approached our table and saw... Uh, said something and recognized we were from America, and he said something. And and as he passed the table, suddenly his voice completely changed, and it was it was like I don't know how to describe it. It was it, 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 the timbre, everything changed, and his face contorted, and it was obvious he was demon possessed, and he began to speak against us, and then he walked out laughing. That man had approached us not in any way wanting deliverance. And walked into the night, and it was it was just an interesting moment. Other times, I have seen uh, I've seen I was in Ethiopia, saw a man that was so out of control that they brought him. Uh, his hands were bound, and he was possessed of many devils. And I watched as an Ethiopia preacher. Uh, we were we were just there eating dinner in between services, and they brought him. And uh, they, the people that brought him one of the missionaries or the evangelists, well, the, the pastor, didn't even, he, he didn't even make a big deal out of it. He's like, oh, don't even bother them. He just stood up, and as he approached, he, he began to say to the man, I command you to be delivered in the name of Jesus Christ, begin to rebuke the devils. And it was a few moments, and we just we, we never even left the table and watched as the man never even laid a hand on him. Uh, it, was, it was not a big scene. It was almost anticlimactic. It, and this man who had been raging and out of control, when he entered into the presence of that anointed um, man of God that no one even knew, yeah. that man just simply took the authority in the Holy Ghost that was in him. The man was delivered instantly, began to weep and cry. They took the, the, the 
bondage off of his hands. Uh, he had been harming himself and others, and the man was filled with the Holy Ghost. And it was just, we just continued eating. Uh, so when, this is the thing I think of, you brought up the demoniac, uh, yep. as he's known, that came and worshiped at the feet of Jesus. There was, there was this conflict that when he was in the presence of God, whatever was in him, whatever good thing or whatever thing that was hungering, it was able to still approach. Yes. And the devil could not keep him away. Uh, here's the thing that I, I, I like to remind myself when I'm encountering these kind of people is that somewhere there's something in them because if the devil had really total control of them, and we're going to get into discernment in a minute, if the devil had really complete control, he would have never allowed them to come to the church. That's right. Because the church is a house of deliverance. So the very fact that they are there, they may, they may be there to disrupt. They may not want deliverance. They may have come to disrupt. I've seen that. And the best thing to do is say, hit the door. Yeah. You know, that's... Uh, it, for their soul, no. But if they don't want deliverance, there's, there, not, there's, not, there's not much I can do because their their flesh is is they're free moral agents. God doesn't force Himself in, and there have been times where really demonic possessed people have left where I've been that have not been delivered because they didn't want it. They were not there for deliverance. They were there to disrupt. And something in the story of the lady, you know, these are, you know, at the, at the, the, the time where the, the voices are crying out of the, the girl that had practiced magic, these are the servants of the Most High God. He rebukes her. He, it had gone on for a little bit, and he, he rebukes her, casts the devil out. But that tells me there was something in her that was crying for deliverance. Yeah. And, uh, Sure, God can do whatever he wants to do, but when it comes to filling, filling people with the Holy Ghost, and I've watched God stop disruption, uh, the, the thing, and you said move to practic practicality here, uh, I'm not into the tie people up, hold them down. You know, to exactly. me, it, it, that's, that's not what we're wrestling with. Yeah, to me, that's kind of a physical approach to try to get... Yeah, and you, you can't force the physical on the spiritual. Who has bewitched us that what we start in the spirit, we think we can complete yeah. in the flesh? Well, it makes me think back to the gentleman that you were talking about in in that restaurant, right? He didn't approach it from a physical standpoint. You you made it seem like he was very calm, mm -hmm. um, and in situations like the last one that we recently dealt with, um, that's kind of how I feel moved. To, to operate in, in that scenario. Mm -hmm. It's it's not necessarily boisterous. It's not, it's get a hold of the situation, handle it in a sensible way. But almost every encounter I've been in it, with the demonic and, and that being cast out, it was actually bringing peace into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. not ratcheting up um, your yeah. own behavior, so to speak. It, there There is, obviously, there's going to be displays. Yeah. Uh, even in Jesus, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I never let them scream out. Well, I get that. I understand why you wouldn't want to, but they did scream out with Jesus and he's God in the flesh, yeah. right? And he calls, the, the devil calls convulsion right there in the very presence of Jesus. So so obviously there, there are some displays that probably will happen. Yeah, on that side, yeah. but on the individual yeah. castings so, part. On the, when... I think part of what we're we're dealing with is is there is <laughs> there are displays that are not even demonic. Agreed. Okay, I'll give you a humorous example. God forbid, uh, and this is sacrilegious. But I had a friend in high school that had the ability. He could. I, I don't even know what it was. Doctors, I have no answers. He could force his shoulder blades to stick out. Hmm. Like he would get them out of joint, and they literally looked like two wings. When, when I tell you, I mean, they're sticking out. It looked like a deformity. He could do something, and they would stick out. And then he could wiggle them. I don't know how in the world he learned to wiggle. His shoulders would be still, uh, but his whatever's back here, he could move. 
And he would have so much fun. This is so ungodly. It's one or God didn't strike him dead. He would go to the altar at youth camp to naive people. And he would go stick those out. And he would get these ugly faces. And he would act like he was possessed. Yeah. And these naive people would come over and begin to pray with him. And he would act like that he was being delivered and his shoulders were hit and they would go crazy. Now, that wasn't wise. That, that young man went through a lot and wound up becoming a preacher of the gospel later. I don't recommend that. I, and it, it's forever humorous it is. I, w- I would be appalled if I knew. But that was an example of, of there was a lack of discernment in the people. Mm-hmm. And here was a way that the flesh... If he had had a more than just trying to be funny in a devious way, if he had had ill intentions, uh, I mean, the Borat movie uh, that yeah. made you know all the circles in the news of the guy acting like he's delivered. There's a lot of things that are done in the flesh that uh, the whole charismatic, you know, the power hmm, and, and tried to the pseudo deliverance ministry movement yeah. has created these scenarios and then a lack of teaching on the subject where we think we've got to hold them down and we've got and and, and they're very real. I'm not belittling the the reality of displays and and when you pray for someone that's demon possessed, keep your eyes open. Yes, you know, watch and pray. Uh, but but this is not it, it's not a contest to see who can be more weird. That's right. Right. This is uh, one of the first things that should be done. Well, first of all, is preparatory prayer. Don't wait till you get there. Uh, a life of prayer. Yes. A prayer of discernment. Lord, let me know when I'm dealing with flesh, when I'm dealing with mental. I mean, I, I've dealt with people that are mental. I mean, you can cast the devil all, all you want. There's no devil there. It's a it's a mental, mental issue. Disorder. Okay. Yeah. So when I should be praying for healing instead of demon possession. And, you know, then the way this gets is there are church cultures that are so in, so uh, obsessed yeah. with demons they seem like where they, the they've, they've learned, oh, I, I, I've got a demon. I, I'm, I go to church every Sunday, but I got a demon. And they, they actually have trash cans ready to start catching throw up well, or vomit, excuse the language. Yeah. That's bogus. You know, I'm not saying that couldn't happen somewhere, but, but churches that have this regularly where they cast it, not in my church. We're, we're not doing that. That That's a work of the flesh. And uh, people need to be very careful before they start go casting out demons without discernment because uh, I've seen I've seen people make bad mistakes mm. casting demons out of, out of people, and there's no demon there. Yeah. And... If that person doesn't want deliverance, it's not going to happen. That's right. And so one of the first things I do from a practical standpoint is, you know, and, and I'm not the I'm not the demon chaser. I'm not the expert on this. And there's probably a lot of varieties from a lot of great men of God. Uh, I have been I've been a part of a number of uh, demon possession, uh, demon situations where people have been delivered. I've I fought devils that have come to my own home. Uh, to to attack our minds, and you don't fight it in the flesh. You fight you fight it in the spirit. Right. You know, and you you get in the Holy Ghost. You, the battle is going to be fear. The battle's not how how strong I can get with my voice. It's going to be fear, and taking authority. And from a practical standpoint, preparatory prayer, prayer, fasting, godly living, uh, and then recognizing. Uh, and I would end with this because I, kn- I know you've got other things to say, and I don't mean to no. be, be doing all this, but what the devil would like to do to someone is, is I, I, I've watched when it happens. Oh, God, where's the preacher? Okay, and, and I get that, that there's, it's about spiritual authority sometimes. But these are, these are the giftings of the body that is a believer. Absolutely. Okay, and what happens is there's this, there's this fear, and sometimes it's a fear of our own frailties and imperfections, and that, oh, God, I had a bad thought yesterday. I can't confront this. Will it expose? Yeah. Is this going to make... Well, this is where you, you, you've got to learn to lean on the scripture that says, when my own heart condemns me, 
He's greater than my heart. This is why we can't do this in the flesh. That's because true. in our there's no, my righteousness is as filthy rags. I can't fight these spirits in the flesh. None of us, none me, of us you, the bishops, the doctors, the, I mean, the, the elders, none of us can do this in the flesh. We're not exorcists. <laughs> this is a work of the Spirit. And if we're truly confronting devils, they have no power over the Holy Ghost. That's right. And don't let fear get in and say, you can't handle this. you got to go. That's not scriptural. Yeah. You're a believer. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. The work of grace is working in you. And when our heart condemns us, the Bible says he is greater than our heart. Yeah, my mind goes to the passage of Scripture where it talks about um, no man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And so, you know, when I'm praying with someone in these situations, I always try to focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, recently, you know, just kind of went down there and, and there was a problem with possession and we were first kind of calm down the situation. Hey, everybody back up. Let's, you know, let's bring some calmness here. But, but in talking to the individual, it was just, you know, I focused on first getting them just to say the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's where my mind goes all the time. Say Jesus, say Jesus. And then, then I try to progress, right? And so I kind of move from say Jesus to, uh, say Jesus, I love you, or say Jesus is Lord. And so, I'm focusing it all on that because I know it's in the power of the Holy Ghost. It's through His name. This is, this is how it happens. There's nothing I can do in it of myself. But if, if I can get that person or if, if through praying with them, I can help move them towards pronouncing the name of Jesus, declaring that they love Jesus, mm -hmm. declaring that Jesus is Lord, that's the way I move. And if, if they're able to say Jesus... If they're able to say, I love you, Jesus, if they're able to say, Jesus is Lord, well, now they're in a place where you know they want deliverance. Mm -hmm. If they won't, in my, we, we've, I've seen it before, if, if they won't say that, I'm under the assumption that they don't want deliverance then. Because they have the ability to say what they want to say. And so if they'll profess the name Jesus, s declare that they love him, I know that they're wanting deliverance. There's hope, there. There's hope. they want deliverance. And Almost every time that they, you can get them to that point, you're only one step away from them receiving the Holy Ghost because now that person is feeling that. And, and the other thing I do a lot of times is you, you think of those definitions of being possessed and it's this harsh control. It's, it's almost like in the Egypt, these, these taskmasters. The other side is bringing into that conversation repeatedly, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. I know others may say differently. I know the voices you may hear in your head right now are telling you differently. But Jesus truly loves you. And I think if we focus on the love of Jesus and getting them to declare that, that it changes that situation. Again, because the Bible says no man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And so I think moving in that direction is helpful. One of the other things that I'm always cognizant of is, and we've had Brother Sanders here recently talk about this, is the laying on of hands. And so I know this passage of Scripture doesn't necessarily go directly or isn't meant for this, but the principle is still there. And that principle is the Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly, neither partake ye of their sins. And so when I read that passage of Scripture, I think the two are connected. Mm -hmm. The laying on of hands and the participating or partaking in other sins. And I think if, if we aren't discerning of what someone's dealing with, I remember when I was a youth pastor, I, I used to ask some of the youth that would go in and lay hands on people, hey, what were you praying for that person for? And if they couldn't tell me, I would say, well, before you lay hands on somebody, you, you need to understand what you're praying for them for. And so when we think about the laying on of hands, it's impartation. It is transfer. And anytime impartation or transfer is taking place, it necessitates or demands both wisdom and purity. Mm -hmm. Because what if, what if I'm dealing with some type of addiction and this particular demon they're possessed with is in that area of addiction? Well, I really don't have the authority necessarily to go down there and lay hands on somebody um, that is possessed in a, an addiction standpoint and could it be that um, if, if I'm in a stage of possibly obsession or oppression 
of a particular addiction. If I lay hands on an individual that is possessed by that, could there be some recoil? Or the other way around, if someone's trying to get deliverance from that, and, and I haven't experienced full deliverance in that myself, you better watch out. And so I, I always caution people not, not to, again, to think that the devil is bigger than what we are, but to say, hey, make sure you know what you're dealing with because you might get yourself in a situation you don't want to be in. i tell you another thing related to, we're talking about the, the big scene. Yes. Uh, I've noticed the devil tries to create big scenes. Yes. It's his nature. It's what got him thrown out of heaven. Because he began, he wanted to take the glory of the light that was reflected off of who he was. His role was not enough. He wanted to ascend above the Most High. That's what we know about him. Yes. And so when he is disturbing, when, when, when these demons that are his followers, these people that are possessed, the thing it wants to do, it wants to, dis- to steal it wants to steal the whatever God's the doing. Glory. It wants to kill the move of God that was there. And it wants to destroy the reputation of the preacher, the church, the people, the move of God. So if it can come cause a ruckus, this is why I wish, this is what I wish would happen. When a demon-possessed person begins to act out, the last thing that needs to happen is 500 people stop everything they're doing and start watching two or three people go into super mode, devil caster out, uh, exorcist. That's the that's the last thing that should happen. Absolutely. What should happen is the church just begins to pray and worship and anointed men and women of God deal with it, and the church just move on because we. Re- this is not. We're not here to to give the devil any glory. The less attention it gets, the better. Absolutely. There's going to be there's going to be things that happen. There's going to be convulsion. There's going to be faces. There's going to be that's how we know the devil is there. But yeah. the the less credit we give the devil, the better. The more it aggravates him. Yes, sir. And I'm I'm all for giving the devil a bad day instead of him giving us a bad day. Amen. So, as we conclude today, as a pastor, um, is there anything that you would direct others uh, in your own church? Say, let's just say there's a pastor watching and and he hasn't seen necessarily this yet. Maybe he's new in ministry. And something happens in the church. How would you kind of direct your congregation, maybe your leaders, to handle or deal with such a situation? Uh, the first thing I would say is don't, don't be hyper-focused on, on demons. Uh, train biblical teaching. People that live godly don't have to live in fear. It doesn't mean you won't encounter it because, I mean, and it, it sometimes when you press in a revival, that's when it happens because you're pressing in. Just like, just like the kingdom coming, those devils begin to, uh, to show themselves. But it's not a thing of fear. Live, live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Always try to bring order and downplay the drama. Not between this. It's, I'm not saying you can't operate in the Holy Ghost, but you don't need 15 busybodies with their cameras out. Absolutely. It perturbs me. Uh, the other day, just to see, I, I typed in uh, uh, deliverance of devils onto YouTube, I was, and I typed sermon. I couldn't find sermons, but I found a lot of videos of prophets casting demons out. Yes. The last thing you need to do is get your camera out. What you need to do is just begin to pray. Begin yeah. to talk to God. And and if you're not immediately involved in it, don't get involved in it. Yeah. Train your church. When this happens, we're spiritual people. There's going to be conflict in the spirit. So what happens is always try to get the spirit of God in the place stronger than the uh, intrusion. It's one of the one of my most frustrating things as a pastor is, and every one of us, and I wish churches, I wish saints would realize the important role they could play, is that there are people that love to be seen. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're gonna they're gonna go right down in front of the pulpit. They're gonna get right in front to either do their exuberant worship. You know, I wonder why can't they do that at their pew sometimes? <laughs> I want, you know, I told one lady, I said, I noticed you you never really have a Holy Ghost fit in the back. Mm-hmm. You always do it up front, and it greatly offended her. But 
but you have people that come from charismatic or you know strange fire services that that come in and yeah I can make a big scene and get the ushers to drag them out which is just gives more credit and then they turn and say well these people you know it just turns into a scene the simplest way is if there's an individual that's making a scene under the banner of worship why don't 15 people just get out and just raise their hands and worship God sincerely and it creates a blanket yeah. that blocks. Well, then it, I've noticed it always seems to calm down because because the devil doesn't get any glory in that. So if people just, if you're not in the mix, then your job is create an atmosphere that takes glory away from the intrusion and places glory back on, on God. Absolutely. One of the things you said that really stuck out and had me thinking, and that was the whole thing with cameras, right? Mm-hmm. And so my mind automatically goes to, this is someone else's daughter or son. This is someone that is having a spiritual experience. And let's say they were possessed, no longer are, and now have the Holy Ghost, Mm -hmm. and they're filled. If that was me, I would want to be known as the person that was filled with the Holy Ghost. I wouldn't want 100 videos out on the Internet of me in in that state. I don't even want to see that if I'm the person that's delivered. I don't yeah. want to see that. Exactly. And so how much more does the person that that has this? And so I think we have to, I think Bishop talks about it all the time, but protect humanity mm-hmm. and and realize that, hey, this is going to be, if they're filled with the Holy Ghost, this is going to be a, a, a great Christian. This is going to be someone that's going to add to the kingdom, add to the local church. And the last thing we want to do is 10 years from now, them being humiliated because someone went back and, Mm-hmm. and saw a picture of them acting a fool. So thank you for being with us today. Man, Any I've enjoyed it. Thoughts? And, and this is important because, as we've been talking about, we're probably going to see more of this because of the acceptance of the spiritual uh, dynamics that Gen Z and, and a new generation are pressing into because of dissatisfaction with dead religion. And it's okay because this is our opportunity. We don't need to give the devil too much credit. He's real. We know that there's real spiritual warfare. Absolutely. But it's not something we live in fear of. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. We have the power. Let's give glory to God instead of glory to the devil. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on All Things Apostolic. Join us tomorrow with Reverend Jeremy Wilbanks.